I hope everyone's doing well. Elfi, thank you for being with us and always yani, getting out of your way to be a technique. And today, the session that was interesting, the session is going to be quite interesting because we're going to talk about some interesting stuff. For, yani, for those, most of you who know Elfi, you know a lot of things that he's done. He's founded Flat Six Labs, Sawari Ventures, with Greek Campus. He's been investing for a very long time. Also, yani, a serial entrepreneur. If, um, we all do mistakes. And we all have lessons learned, and some of them are really painful. Some of them are funny. Some of them are, you know, just casual. If, uh, yani, talking to Elfi kid about his mistakes as a VC. Yeah, yani, I don't know when was your first investment that you've done as a as a VC. How how long was that? Uh, my first tech investment was in 1986. It was a company that made uh, microwave filters and oscillators and some of the precursors to RFIDs. And how did that go? It, it actually went, uh, the business went kind of medium. We sold it to another company and uh, they gave us stock, got our money back for the stock. And then one day the stock went up 5x. We we sold and got out. It was just pure luck. Okay, it wasn't not genius. It was pure luck. But it kind of got me uh, addicted and very interested to the concept of what tech investing can do and the leverage it can give you. And 5x is a is a good return. But how long did that take? How many years? A year and a half. A year and a half. That's brilliant. So, very like I said, luck. There was, we got out. I think we were up 25 percent or something uh, when we sold for the stock. That's really cool. But I assume that you've done some mistakes and some things really went bad as a VC. And he, tell us more about about that. What's the the two big mistakes and almost always their mistakes going in, not during. And the first one is uh, trusting the wrong person. And the second one is uh, loving the idea much more than the entrepreneur. And thinking that maybe you as a VC can have a more positive impact on the idea, on the company, than the entrepreneur and the person who's actually running it. So, you know, the, the, the old one plus me is three formula. It's, it's not a good investing formula. So, yeah, you need to trust the right people that they can do and achieve what, what they are saying or claiming that they're going to be achieving. Maybe not the business model, but on everything else. I, I think you have to evaluate the skill set and dedication and integrity of the entrepreneurs you're investing with. I, I think um, maybe in reverse order, okay? Integrity number one, skill set number two, dedication number three. I, I, I give them in the other order, but that's, I think that's, that's the order to filter in. It, make, it makes sense, and I think in you know, many of the deals that and the companies that we've invested in and you know, they, they failed, we, most of the time, we weren't really upset from the founders, maybe from the situation and how it went, but the founders were, you know, they did their best and they were honest. But in some cases, of course, you know, integrity, we weren't really sure about that. But maybe also moving to the Greek campus, you know, you've, you've done amazing things downtown in Cairo and, and then on the other side of town and the, the expansions that are coming, but I'm sure that this wasn't like a, a beginner's luck thing. I'm sure that there were a lot of struggles, but also some mistakes there. Um, uh, a lot of mistakes, but um, some in evaluating the audience and some in evaluating the project. I mean, the easiest thing was when we took over the library, the, you know, the evaluation, the library had air conditioning to cool books, not people. And ended up being the largest expense we have was beefing up the air conditioning in the library because you had to grow it, you know, add 30, 40 tons of capacity. Uh, on the client side, 
we actually expected that if we signed a deal with the three, four big companies like Vodafone and Google and Microsoft, that all the small companies would come. Well, the security uh, advisors for the big company says, don't go anywhere in the Tahrir, and none of them came. And the small companies came, and then the big companies wanted to be near them. So uh, the business plan worked out being exactly the opposite of how I envisioned it. Which is you know, maybe like startups when they when they start they put a full business plan and then they say this is this is my customer that's what I'm going to do and then they build everything around it and then they realize that this is not what my customers want these are probably are not the right personas so it's the same thing with investing more or less but realizing things early on would save you a lot I think but I mean at the end of the day the Greek campus was something that is is something that is amazing and it's attracting everyone so. It's really a cool place, and I'm looking forward to the next expansion. I mean, I think the the part that I think is is the best is that it identified a new business model that's being copied all over, and I think that's a good thing because we need more, and we need more spaces where people can get together and collaborate, and we need uh, more investors and more startups. So we're in a great business because competition is good, more players are good, is good. And I also, and, you know, I also think was brilliant during COVID the expansion uh, to Zaid or Sept October for the other week campus where no one was opening physical stores, and and then you you took over that place and you just turned it to something different. Well, uh, again, we were fortunate in that COVID reduced the demand for retail and space opened up, so. Um, Sometimes you take risk and it works out and you get lucky and sometimes you take risk and get hammered. So we've, you know, taken risk and got hammered before. Yeah, but moving back, Elfie, to, to startups and, you know, we've seen a lot of things go south. And some of those maybe wouldn't have if they had proper governance, maybe, you know, proper boards. Uh, so boards are there to, to make sure that the startup is being supported, moving in the right direction, there's proper uh, corporate governance there. But sometimes they could be harmful, and I'm sure that it went, you know, in your journey with all the startups that you've invested in, you've seen boards that have really done a good job, but others that have not. Can you tell us more about that? I would say the first thing boards need to do is meet, okay? So a lot of times boards don't even meet, and things are conducted informally on the telephone. Um, I have been on some great boards that have different perspectives and people bring a different point of view and it's collaboration towards a common goal. And unfortunately, I've been on some dysfunctional boards where people have self-interest or because of contracts you can't get rid of them or individuals on a board are representing a company yet they have private investments in another company that's uh, competing with the company they're on the board of. Uh, so the dysfunctionality and the functionality of a board is very important. And I think it's key uh, as a VC to diligence the board composition. Um, and again, the entrepreneur, the company, I really think that the board should be one of the key diligence items along with legal and financial diligence that we all do and, and maybe in, you know if you can share with us in some situations where boards were there they were present but still there were failures or resistance maybe some of that you know in companies that you invested in I, I, I actually there's a couple of board members I'd like to do a brain scan on because I think there was something completely dysfunctional <laughs> in how their processor worked <laughs> all right it it was so extreme and so non-commercial behavior right not just bad for the company but self-destructive so um, I mean we won't go into specific examples but I will tell you that there are situations where I have seen destructive board members have reduced the value of a company deliberately okay through their actions and um, you know we don't want to be in that situation. I, I think really a instead of meeting just the founder and the team and the senior execs, any investor should spend quite a bit of quality time with the board. And, and uh, 
I'm sure that you've also seen, you know, startups that were, you know, about to close, failing, they running out of cash or whatever, any other operational problems, but they maybe have pivoted and done a change that has saved them. So can you share some examples of those? Or maybe if there were so any examples. People talk about pivots a lot, but the timing of a pivot is very, very key because the further down the road you are, the less likely you're going to be willing to admit that you need to pivot. So early pivots are easier for the ego and for the organization to turn. Um, only once or twice have I seen a company go down the road and pivot when they have money left for two, three months and get to that last, you know, that last idea and make it work and it pops and actually they make money. Um, my, my favorite pivot company, and it was kind of pivot on two fronts, is a company called Instabug that some of you may have heard of. But Instabug actually started as a company called A-Star Apps, right? And they were going to be a service company to do bug detection and instead switch to uh, a software solution instead of somebody sending it to you and you're, you, know, you put people on the job to inspect code. And they made that pivot early. The other pivot they made was there were two engineers, and one day they came in and said, I'm not CEO anymore. He's CEO, and I'm CTO, and we're switching jobs. And so they did two pivots at the same time. Um, but it was early enough they hadn't gone down the road. Had they built 50 employees and realized that we're not going to get the revenues, it would have been much more difficult. So if you're going to pivot, be honest with yourself early. And we need to pivot now, not when you're about to run out of money. And, and this brings us back to, to mistakes that we do. Sometimes you know, you're pivoting when you're realizing that this was a mistake or is going to be a mistake. But we all make mistakes in our lives. And, and it's very important to maybe be in a mindset of realizing that this is a mistake and how we handle that mistake. So how, how do you handle mistakes when, when they happen, when, when you do mistakes as Elfie? Um, I get really upset and I hold on to them forever. Okay? And, uh, but that's for mistakes because you hold on to them so you learn from them so you don't do them again. Right? But, you know, there's uh, celebrating mistakes and failure, that's BS. Okay? Don't celebrate that crap. All right? Have it really, really motivate you to never do it again. Have it motivate you to learn something. Um, and the thing I will tell you is the things I don't regret, I don't, I, I mean, I, I regret them a little bit, but the things I don't regret, I don't ever regret selling something at a profit and somebody else bought it and made much more money than I did. If I made a profit, we're happy, right? Um, uh, I, I regret not selling something, not exiting or investing in the wrong thing, right? But if you invest and you make money, and you could have made more, that's okay. So the, the regrets are from the investor side that way. On the operational side, there are lots and lots of mistakes. So I would say in early stage companies, I'd say our biggest mistake that repeats over and over again in a lot of companies is we don't plan cash flow well enough. And everybody becomes optimistic about, yes, I'm going to make that sale. Yes, I'm going to make those numbers. I'm going to stretch the money to last me this long. And um, my, my dad, who was a doctor, didn't knew very little about business and started his own little business that grew and became very successful. But he said, there's only three rules. Never run out of cash. Don't run out of cash and make sure you don't run out of cash. All right? Yep, so uh, yeah, these are three valuable rules, cash. And this is the, you know, right now, this is the number one reason for startup failures after COVID is running out of cash for early stage founders. And then, you know, comes that the, pro the part where you're not really providing a product or service that the market needs. So you're just doing nothing. But, you know, these are the two important things. Um, Alfie, it was a great pleasure having you. Thank you for sharing your mistakes. 